Right, it's 11 o'clock. Um, so I think we'll start folks and a, a very good morning to you. This morning um, webinar is the UK's net zero carbon transport infrastructure future. So there's been rapid development with electric cars and infrastructure is accelerating the UK's greener future. Vastly lower carbon emissions are planned for transport infrastructure with a ban on the new petrol, diesel, and even hybrid car sales from 2035, and maybe as soon as 2030. Sales of electric vehicles continue to rise, and with a new type of car, there's a call for a new type of infrastructure to keep them on the road. Right now, electric cars are charged in homes or on publicly available charges, and there are not nearly enough charging points to go around for the number of electric vehicles that we'll be needing soon. As we will hear this morning, investment opportunities abound for building the infrastructure necessary to power this new way of life, starting with charging stations for electric vehicles. Today's webinar will examine specific investment opportunities for this infrastructure, with a focus on projects already in progress. We'll look at how these investment structures fit within it in an investment portfolio. I have great pleasure in introducing the PLSA's education partner, GridServe, a provider of net zero carbon sustainable energy and transport infrastructure. We're going to hear from Toddington Harper, Chief Executive of GridServe, and his colleague, Mark Henderson, their Chief Investment Officer. They'll tell us all about this new infrastructure category, how it works, exciting projects that are underway or about to be launched, and very importantly, how this investment can fit in the pension fund portfolio. My name is Helen Lamb, and I work in membership at the PLSA, working closely with you, our members, to understand the issues facing your pension schemes and to ensure our work helps to provide guidance, practical support and quality learning opportunities. I'll be chairing today's session. So now I'm going to start with a polling question. So you can see it on your screen in front. And the question is, how has COVID-19 changed your appetite for investing in sustainable energy infrastructure. And there's very much a, a winner here, as we can all see, with hasn't changed is 76%, followed by it's more important now at 24%, and then less important now and other at 0%. So now it is over to Toddington Harper. I'm very pleased to welcome him from GridServe. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here talking to you. Um, you know, hope you're looking forward to, to this morning's session. Um, there's really a session in two parts. So the piece that I'm going to be focused on is, uh, is really talking about the infrastructure itself that we're, that we're delivering, talking about kind of more bro broadly the shift to to net zero carbon transport infrastructure. Uh, and then that will be followed by my colleague, Mark, who will really focus more on the investment side and the opportunities that, that arise from, uh, um, from, from this really significant transition that, that, that's underway and gathering pace extremely fast. Um, so just briefly, uh, for those who don't know GridServe, and I'm sure a lot more people will know GridServe by the end of November, um, but for those who don't yet, um, GridServe's you know, our purpose as a company is to deliver sustainable energy uh, and to deliver it on such a scale that we really have the opportunity to, to move the needle on climate change. Um, this is certainly not an endeavor we, we feel we can do alone, but we certainly are doing everything we can do. Um, it's a, you know, we, we, we've kind of reached crisis point um, in terms of climate terms. The IPCC uh, data suggests that within uh, less than 10 years, around seven years, we're going to reach saturation of carbon emissions in our atmosphere that's going to drive global temperatures above one and a half degrees of warming. Uh, and that would be you know, really catastrophic. Um, and we're certainly on track to exceed two degrees of warming 
um, within, within the next 25 years. Uh, and, and that will put us above the targets agreed in the Paris Agreement. So, so really it's very important for, for all of us now, um, collectively who have the opportunity to do so, um, to really do everything we can um, to uh, move the needle on climate change, to prevent emissions rising above the point where we have uh, effectively, you know, the next generation has no ability to do, to do anything about, about this. Uh, and it's something that we need to do now. Um, and we're really focused on doing that. Our, our, you know, the, way, the way that we are able to deliver at scale is we're a very integrated company. What does that mean? It means we, uh, we finance projects. Um, we organize the financing, financing structures is probably more accurate for projects. Um, we develop them, which means we go and obtain the necessary planning permissions uh, and identify sites. We then build out a sustainable energy infrastructure uh, and we thereafter you know, own, operate and manage that infrastructure for, for its lifetime. Um, and uh, you know, we, we don't own all of the infrastructure that we, that we develop, but certainly when it comes to electric transport uh, charging infrastructure, um, we, we certainly do. So that's kind of briefly kind of where we're coming from uh, as an organization. Um, and we're just gonna start with really just, just giving you a kind of a high level talk about electric vehicle uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure uh, as a whole uh, and the transition to, to electric vehicles. So um, I'm sure everybody's noticed that there's a lot more electric cars on the roads. Um, you know, it's, it used to be a rarity only a few years ago that you would go out and see an electric car. Uh, when I got my first electric car seven years ago, people would stop in the streets and point at me, uh, you know, because it was completely foreign to, to see such a, you know, and it was really, it was a, a very nice electric car. It was a Tesla. Uh, and it was really the first time people saw an electric car that wasn't, you know, boxy and suboptimal. Um, and really they used to stop and stare. Uh, people don't stop and stare anymore. It's very commonplace. Um, and what's happening now is that there are many, many more electric vehicles arriving en masse um, to kind of, you know, to, to, to form part of the next evolution in our, in our automotive industry. It's happening very quickly, which is the transition to, to mass electric vehicles. Um, and that really can be represented very clearly from the graph on the left hand side, uh, which says that by 2021, and remarkably that's already nearly upon us, uh, there will be over 200 types of electric vehicle models commercially available in Europe. Um, and this isn't just Tesla anymore, Tesla is one of the names uh, in that list, but this is effectively all of the major automotive companies um, have either committed the future, either in part or in whole, to electric vehicles. Um, you know, and that starts from the, you know, the inventor of the combustion engine um, right the way through to, uh, to, to the new entrance to the market. Um, so it's a very exciting uh, time. It's also a, a time of you know, considerable change. Um, and it's obviously very, very important that, uh, that, um, that you know, people have an opportunity to work out where they want to sit within that, within that sphere that's happening and happening very, very quickly. You know, alongside the vehicles coming to market, the graph on the right hand side uh, is the expectation of um, more or less directly correlated to, to vehicle take up. And I think one of the, um, one of the takeouts from, from this COVID uh, you know, period that we've all been through, which is clearly an extremely challenging period, um, is that when it comes to electric vehicles, it hasn't really held electric vehicles back remarkably. Uh, I guess we wouldn't have known what would happen if it hadn't been for COVID, but you know, the automotive companies like Tesla's shares are continuing to increase. Um, and uh, an EV sales continue to you know, double, triple, quadruple, um, you know, uh, across where they were a year ago. So um, huge numbers of electric vehicles are, are coming to market. I'm just trying to move the slide. Um, so where are these vehicles going to charge? Um, again, apologies for you who've already got an electric car, but for those who don't, and the estimate at the moment is around 1% of the UK's fleet have electric vehicles. 1% um, of, of the vehicles in the UK's fleet as a whole are electric, which means 99% of them uh, are not yet. Uh, that figure is looking to change considerably because the government has suggested a target of 2035, possibly as short as 2030, to phase out um, the ability to purchase a new uh, petrol, diesel, or even hybrid vehicle um, in favor of, of zero or, or net zero vehicles. So where are all these vehicles gonna charge? Um, so, you know, th there are really three principal areas where people charge electric vehicles. There's home charging, uh, if you can, and we're, we're going to talk a bit more about each of those. There's destination charging, so that's when we talk about charging it in workplaces, car parks, supermarkets, and so on. 
And then there's this third category of public charging. And, and that's an area we are very focused on. And in the context of investment opportunities, we think that's a very significant, uh, significant area because it's really an area where we're able to get to scale uh, very, very quickly. Um, and we, we really understand that that is um, clearly something which is required, particularly for the audience of, of this presentation. So just briefly on, um, oops, on, uh, on, uh, on home charging, you know, it's great if you can do it, but the, the principal issue uh, is you, you, you typically, everybody can't. So 40% of people have no around, nobody's got the exact number, have no ability to charge at home. Um, you know, and even if you do have the ability to charge at home, i.e. if you have off street parking, the other really significant challenge is that the grid wasn't designed uh, for people to charge their vehicles at seven kilowatts, which is the average power that you can that, that a home charger now is. So homes were designed to to entirely your whole house was designed to use one or two kilowatts of power. And so when you add an electric car charger in, which is seven kilowatts, um, that's a very, very substantial increase. And the real challenge comes when many people in the same street start adding those additional seven kilowatt charges. And there's a very interesting report called Four Court Thoughts created by the by National Grid, which has suggested that, you know, as many as five, possibly more, possibly less, depending on the circumstances, um, vehicles would need in a particular street to add home charging for that street to be overloaded in itself. And that's a very, very significant challenge. Um, it's also quite difficult to charge commercial vehicles at home. You need different kind of charging regimes and different ways of working it out. Um, home charge is very slow, which is fine if you're turning up and you're plugging in. Uh, it gets more complicated when you have two vehicles uh, that are both electric. It's pretty obvious you think, well, of course I can turn up and charge. I'm gonna, not gonna forget to plug in like your mobile phone, but you can take my word for it. Somebody who does live with two electric cars, it is quite tricky. Um, when you, uh, you know, when you turn up one of your, 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 you know, one of the vehicles at your property is already charging. So it, it is a good option if you can do it, but it's by no means a panacea. And it certainly takes a very, very long time to charge. So if you need to turn up uh, and move quickly, it, it's not really an option. Um, the next area is something which is broadly referred to as destination charging. Uh, destination charging, it, it's the sort of suit of charge you would expect in your, in your workplace or in a supermarket really the charging should be defined by the destination itself. So if you're going to a supermarket, ideally you'd have, have a charger that's suitable for the, you know, to deliver a reasonable amount of charging for the time that you would spend in that supermarket. And, uh, and, and, and it's, it should be optimized uh, accordingly. Um, equally for your workplace, you want to ensure that, you know, if you're in your workplace for you know, five, you know, eight hours a day, that, that you get the right amount of charge. One of the challenges about about destination charging is that thus far uh, it hasn't really been worked through in such a in such a, a kind of a clear a clear straightforward pattern uh, and actually people have just installed an awful lot of charges in a lot of different locations without a great deal of thought to the location itself. Um, as a result, you uh, you find um, you know different quality charges, different power charges. Um, you've got a lot of legacy charges that not very really, very really easy to use. Some charges aren't very well maintained. There's variable technologies, there's variable qualities. And one of the additional challenges is that uh, workplaces also, um, you know, as an example, or, or destinations also have grid restrictions. And so you don't typically find the number of, uh, of charges in that location designed to serve the, the amount of people that could potentially use them. So again, it's another helpful piece of the jigsaw, but it's a lot more complex. And, it, and where we sit at this moment in time uh, is certainly probably the most difficult one. Um, to, to, to work through. Then the, really the third piece of this is, is public charging infrastructure. And that's just infrastructure that you know, if you get an electric vehicle and you're one of the people who can't do home charging um, or you're on a long journey, you just need to charge to get to your destination. You need to have complete confidence that you're gonna be able to turn up, you're gonna be able to charge, it's gonna work, it's gonna be fast and you're gonna be looked after. And that's the whole class of, of, uh, of public charging infrastructure. Um, you need to cater for many types of electric vehicles. You need very high power. Um, you need open access. It needs to be very easy to use. Um, but of course, you also need to deal with all of the, you know, some of the legacy uh, issues with existing, uh, existing solutions. Um, grid reinforcement is typically capital intensive. In fact, this sector as a whole, the public charging piece is more capital intensive uh, than other areas. Um, and there's clearly a lot of work that needs to be gone. 
uh, in respect to future proofing. Um, the good news is, is that this area is well in hand and you know, GridServe really, I think, are a company that's very much at the forefront of that. And the reason that we, um, that, we that I said at the beginning of the slide, that uh, you know, by the end of uh, November, more people will know about us than they currently do, is about a year ago, we announced that we were going to build a network of public charging uh, infrastructure, public charging infrastructure network of electric forecourts across the UK that would enable anybody to charge any type of electric vehicle um, as quickly and conveniently uh, as they could use a petrol or a diesel car. And this was some of the visual imagery that we, uh, that we said we were going to build. Um, and, uh, and you know, you can see from this picture here, which was taken around nearly a month ago, um, that we have actually done precisely what we said we were going to do. And by the end of November, this site will be fully operational. Um, and, um, you know, really will be, you know, the first of its type infrastructure that will allow anybody to charge any type of electric vehicle without any worry uh, and the kind of inconvenience that you currently have associated with the relatively small amount of electric vehicles that there already are. Uh, and certainly, uh, and certainly this, this infrastructure is very much ready for the mass market. Um, it's also the first infrastructure in itself that in the same way that a petrol forecourt, you have additional convenience like you know, coffee or supermarket and so on, um, that we also have that embedded within this as well. So there's a combination of partners that will be, uh, that will be in, in this building. You can see here, uh, there will be um, WH Smiths, there will be a Costa, there will be supermarket booths. We also have a post office. Um, and in addition to the, uh, the kind of, you know, again, modern convenience that we'd expect in a modern petrol forecourt being replicated in this area, we also have an upstairs, uh, which is a, um, you know, a, a lounge type environment designed to be a really fantastic place to wait while your vehicles are charging. Um, and it, it also has a, a secondary option to, to double up as, a, as an area where people can learn a huge amount about electric vehicles uh, in, in addition, because as I mentioned in the beginning, there is over 200 types of electric vehicles coming to market, um, or available in the market, sorry, from, from next year. Uh, and, and there's a huge amount of information that, that, that needs to be learned. Um, so in addition to that, it's very, very important that as well as providing charging infrastructure, that the energy itself um, is, uh, is clean, is renewable, um, and ultimately is net zero. Um, and the other exciting thing that we are that we will be doing is that from the moment that we open uh, Braintree Electric Forecourt, the 24th of, of November, um, all of the energy at that site will either be zero carbon uh, or it will be net zero carbon. Zero carbon in the context that there is solar energy on site and net zero carbon in the context that any, any energy that we, aren't, we don't produce directly on site, which we import from the grid, we net off against a kilowatt hour that we export onto the grid 44 miles up the road from this project here. And this project in itself will produce enough energy to drive all of the energy requirements, um, the average requirements of around 8,000 miles a year uh, that a typical vehicle does for around 5,000 electric vehicles. So um, I, I guess the, the point that we're making here is that net zero isn't, isn't really a concept that is gonna happen at some point in the future. Uh, net zero is something which is happening this year, from this year onwards. Um, uh, it is, uh, in, it's going to be happening in the context of what we are doing from the 24th of, of November onwards. There will be 30 high power chargers. Um, again, you know, so anybody can, can, can turn up. People would typically charge in 20 or 30 minutes. There'll be convenience. There'll be the full range of facilities uh, and also an opportunity for people to really understand about electric vehicles and have the confidence to really make the transition. Um, because, you know, that's e equally important here. Uh, and the reason that we're kind of doing both is we're following a, uh, a structure called Sun to Wheel, uh, which is bringing together a new ecosystem. Um, we're harvesting energy in the from, from the sun, um, which is the, if you like, a modern equivalent of, a, uh, of an oil well, because actually all the energy in petrol and diesel is actually stored sunlight from several hundred million years ago. So we're kind of bypassing that stage. We're harvesting energy in a solar farm, uh, we're storing that energy in, in batteries. Um, we're using the grid to help, you know, to help, help move that energy across the country. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, we are then 
putting that energy and linking it to electric vehicles. Because again, we, we, we're building this project with support from the British government, um, but also from uh, you know, considerable support from Hitachi Capital. And we'll be launching an electric vehicle piece that's connected to this so that any vehicle that people take, um, and these vehicles will be under, under finance agreements, uh, leasing agreements, um, link will, will include net zero charging at these electric forecourts. And the really important piece about being able to deliver this whole ecosystem uh, is that it means that we can keep costs down. So not only will be vehicles be net zero, but they will be, um, but they will be less expensive than petrol or diesel vehicles um, from, uh, from the 24th of November onwards. You know, i.e. people should have no reason not to uh, not to transition to an electric vehicle, because it's not going to cost more than a petrol or diesel, because when you include financing and also solar energy, it will cost less. So net zero transport, the overall messaging that we're, we're showing, net zero transport is something which is going to be happening from 2020. It's not going to cost you more than petrol or diesel. It will cost you less. Uh, it's not going to be coming from this, you know, the, this, this argument, which is a very good argument that people would say, but what if the energy comes from coal? Uh, it's not going to come from coal, it's going to come from solar energy and other forms of renewable energy too, uh, and it's going to be available now. Uh, and, and really, um, this is the beginning of something which is going to scale considerably in the next few years. Um, because you know, the fact that there are, um, that the government has laid down the gauntlet for you know, banning new petrol, diesel or hybrid cars by 2030 or 2035, it's just considerable. So you know, the, the, the type of infrastructure that we and others are delivering um, will really ramp up from the, this, this point onwards in order to be able to service that requirement. Which then raises another question of, well, which is the right horse to back? You know, is this the right option? Is it, uh, is it electric vehicles? Is it, is, it, is it hydrogen? Is it biofuel? You know, hands up, which one should it be? And so we thought it'd be useful to share some insight around why we as an organization are backing electric vehicles in conjunction with renewable energy than some of the other options. We thought it'd be useful to share some of that insight with you. Um, personally, I have a lot, of, a lot of experience in this area because around 20 years ago now, I created a hydrogen fuel cell business. And I spent a lot of time, a lot of effort and, and money trying to make it work. Um, and the reason that, that we're not doing that now is that you know, if you take hydrogen as a starting point, the, the infrastructure just clearly isn't there. There's very few hydrogen um, charging stations in the country. Hydrogen is quite tricky to deal with. Uh, in, in itself. Um, if you compare, compare that to the number of places where you can get electricity in the country already today, it's really incomparable. Um, and actually hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, um, but it is typically connected with something else. So either combined with carbon in hydrocarbon fuels, which is clearly not very helpful in the context of trying to get away from producing, emitting carbon dioxide um, and other greenhouse gases, um, or, it's tight, or it's connected to water, H2O. Now, the issue with that is that you can separate hydrogen and oxygen uh, by electrolyzing uh, water and really using renewable energy to do that. But it's a very, very expensive process. And the end summary is that hydrogen, you know, in comparison to using the raw renewable electricity in the first place and putting that directly into electric vehicles, maybe via a battery, another battery in the first place, if you compare that to using that electricity to split water, compress that energy, uh, into, you know, into, into a form that's, uh, that allows you to get a, you know, a relevant number of miles on your electric vehicle, on your, on your, they're still actually electric vehicle, on your fuel cell electric vehicle. And you compare that to, um, to using electric vehicles just combined with renewable energy, the cost of hydrogen is probably three to five times more than just using that renewable energy in itself. And so we as a company, I go back to the, what's our purpose, it's to deliver sustainable energy and move the needle on climate change. We have a very short window of time to do it. And our view is that people will, uh, will make these choices, will make the right choices and, and deliver, you know, deliver the right direction of travel. Um, but people are less inclined to do it if it's going to cost more. And people are very inclined to do it if it's going to cost less, which is why we as a company are focused on, you know, I made the point about electric vehicles not costing more uh, in terms of what people pay per month than a petrol or diesel alternative. You know, I, even the capex of the vehicle might be more expensive to start with, but probably not for long. Um, in terms of the financing of the agreement, it should be less expensive than petrol or diesel from day one for, uh, for you know, hopefully all of the vehicle types we, we will see. So the next point is fuel cells. Fuel cells and hydrogen go, uh, go pretty well together. 
Um, you, you don't need, uh, need fuel cells. If you have hydrogen, you can burn hydrogen in modified combustion engines, but it's not very efficient. Um, uh, fuel cells um, uh, are, uh, are electrochemical devices. You put a fuel in and it converts it into electricity and it does it in a, in a chemical way, um, electrochemical way. Um, the challenge about that is that fuel cells are, are today still very expensive, they're complex, the warranties are complex uh, them, themselves, they require that green hydrogen, uh, and as we've talked about, that's already expensive. There's mi limited manufacturing capacity, and you know, when you compare that to the you know, huge gigafactories springing up all over the world for batteries, um, they, they really are incomparable at the moment, uh, and, so, and it requires addi additional infrastructure. So the, there is, I'm sure, a, a role for hydrogen and fuel cells uh, in the transition to net zero, you know, there is no single solution, there is no single path to net zero. Um, but in comparison to, uh, to electric vehicles and, uh, and, and batteries, we think that role is probably very niche because we can deliver at scale large number of vehicles, over 200 models today, and we can do it less expensive in a way that's less expensive than not just petrol or diesel, but also the other options on the table. In terms of other options, biofuels and synthetic fuels are, are, are two very important ones. Biofuels um, is you need to be very careful with biofuels. Um, people had gone, you know, focused on this in the past, but it ended up doing some pretty unhelpful things like fertilizing fields with uh, with fossil fuel based fertilizers um, and uh, and using the crops that were produced to which could have been eaten in the food chain to make fuels with, or, or worse still, you know, cutting down you know forests and creating palm plant plantations. And clearly, that's not a very good idea. So. If we're going to use biofuels, we need to be very careful. Synthetic fuels is clearly um, a very interesting space. Synthetic fuels you can manufacture by, for example, combining hydrogen with carbon dioxide out of the air. Um, and, and that's really useful because you can get quite a good energy density and probably synthetic fuels have a good use in, 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 in shipping and in airplanes and so on. But again, it, it's currently quite expensive and, and, and also in comparison to, uh, to uh, kind of road transport, probably quite niche. There are other options in electric vehicles as well. Battery replacement, a number of companies have tried that typically unsuccessfully. Uh, and there's other options for, for you know, on-road charging, um, which, uh, which again, are, are a little bit more tricky. So hopefully that's given you some, you know, additional insight from our perspective around, you know, the infrastructure that's coming, the time frame that this infrastructure is arriving at, um, and, uh, you know, and we would also be absolutely delighted if there are any of you out there will reiterate at the end, who'd like to come and visit the electric forecourt, either when it goes, is open to the public on the 24th of November, or in advance of that, we'd be very, very happy to, to talk you through this, uh, and really, you know, help, help, you know, together, we're in this together, uh, we need to achieve this outcomes together, you know, delivering what we're doing is not possible without the capital required to keep this going. And uh, you know, collectively, we, we'd really love to connect with you on this journey and, and see what we can do to help move, move this needle. So I hope that's a useful bit of insight. Um, over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Troddington. Um, so my name is Mark Henderson. Um, I'll put myself uh, on the screen. Um, and uh, I'm a Chief Investment Officer of uh, GridServe. Um, uh, and I'm a former investment banker as well, so hopefully I come from more of your side of the table and can speak a bit more of your language. Before we do that, I'd like to just quickly hand back to Helen in order to uh, introduce the second poll we're going to have at, uh, on this call. We've got three polls, this is the second one. Um, Helen, do you want to uh, take that one away? Thanks, Mark. Yes, we've got another poll now. So while we're raising the polls to, to come up, I've seen a couple of questions. Uh, I thought it would be useful to, uh, to uh, provide some insight into some of that. Um, so one of the questions is anything being done with working with Tesla to use the infrastructure? So the answer is yes. So we, we work with Tesla. There are Tesla charges also at Braintree Electric Forecourt. Um, and I think that really demonstrates that, uh, that really what's important is that we build infrastructure uh, in partnership with you know, with, uh, with, uh, with, with you know, every entity in this space so that all the infrastructure that we, that we build is, is well utilized uh, and can deal with every type of electric vehicle. Sorry, everyone. Yes, here we are. Um, what is your preferred method of investing into infrastructure? Is it green bonds, 
infrastructure fund, investment trust, not yet investing, or other. Right, I will share the results. It seems that infrastructure fund is a clear winner with 50%. This is followed by not yet investing at 31%. Other comes at 13%, and investment trust comes at 6%. Thank you for that, uh, <clears throat> Helen. Um, that particularly surprised me too much um, as uh, some of these investment um, methods are still in their infancy. And for example, green bonds, which I'm going to come on to, there probably aren't established green bonds in this area just yet, but very useful to, to see those thoughts. So with apologies if I'm trying to teach you to suck eggs, um, I thought it useful just to put up a summary of why Michael should be interested in this asset class. Um, and as I'm sure a lot of you guys will know, there are many good reasons why investing in infrastructure as a whole, because for one thing it's uncorrelated to equity returns, which is perhaps a particularly attractive um, feature at the moment in the current environment. Um, but also the long-term asset-backed cash yields uh, is extremely attractive. It's good at any time and again, in the current market volatility and uncertainty around COVID and the effects of it, it's probably a, a very good time to be investing more into this area. I've worked in infrastructure investment for probably about 30 years. During that time, I've seen several recessions, market adjustments, and other blips or, or very large bumps along the way. But infrastructure does have a benefit of being able to continue very smoothly it may have a few um, dips and a few uh, problems which will affect it, but it does continue as a very, in a very solid manner. So there's a very strong um, hedge to a lot of other investment classes. Um, I should say that's in the project finance area, which I'm particularly focused in. Uh, I've never seen a renewable energy project financing actually default. Uh, some of the parents may have done, but uh, the structures themselves have uh, provided uh, a very good insulation against that. Um, another area, of course, is that ESG is now everywhere. We're now seeing a lot of uh, investment and talk about ESG and getting involved in sustainable environmental infrastructure. But I think, crucially, you can actually get value as well as supporting your values. So the yields at the moment are incredibly low. 10-year yields have been below 2% for over five years. And here are assets which allow you to have debt at 3% upwards, um, equity unlevered on probably 5 6% upwards into double digit, and leveraged equity into well into to double digit return rates. So there is very strong value here. Um, and on a risk adjusted basis, it gets better as well once the projects are constructed, which tends to be the biggest area of, of, um, of risk. Um, and uh, that's something which I'll come back to, but we, we avoid in our uh, asset classes. Finally, uh, COVID-19 uh, has been a, a, a pretty sour time for us all, but if there's any silver lining, it's, I believe, the actually more of a green lining, that there is a much greater intent uh, amongst individuals, amongst firms, and blow me down even amongst politicians to build back better, or even as I saw Boris say once, build back greener as well. So there's a great desire to invest much more into kickstarting economies, rebuilding our infrastructure, but more importantly, taking this as a chance to press the reset button and do it in a much more sustainable environmentally friendly manner. So um, let's look at how to invest into these areas. And when we look at uh, the investment routes, which I flagged up um, earlier on in the poll, um, we'll just move this on, potential investment structures. So I'm gonna ask you another poll, just the last poll at the end of this um, slide, but I just flagging what are the ways of investing there? 
obviously one can uh, have an equity fund uh, or a private equity fund and decide to direct invest, to invest directly into companies. But the problem then is, well, which companies? What kind of companies? Are we talking about people who develop projects, technology developers, equipment manufacturers? There's a whole plethora of different areas which to get involved. And importantly, you need to pick winners to do that. Um, and in, a, in the transport infrastructure world, particularly the Z net zero carbon transport infrastructure, this is very much a new area and a very much more risky place to be picking those, those individual winners. Infrastructure funds, now those one hands down in, in the poll we just had, and I'm not surprised because they are now a nicely established and very successful um, area for, to invest in. Um, they have very good solar funds, if you look at the yield codes, if you like, um, and wind funds. Some are more general as well, um, but none actually have an established, dedicated transport infrastructure focus, um, other than one actually which the government set up. Um, and uh, even that's only made, I think, about two investments. And that's the reason why it's like, it can be a problem, because we need more assets to be developed and able to make either the transport infrastructure part of a, an infrastructure fund a more meaningful um, part of the whole, or before we start seeing dedicated zero carbon transport infrastructure funds. Um, investment trusts or unit trusts, um, again, not uh, seeing anything being set up with a dedicated transport infrastructure focus at the moment. In fact, when I say transport infrastructure, any forms of transport, including shipping, rail, airports. Um, that's probably because it would be too specialized to do that. And I believe that a lot of these unit trusts, investment trusts, need to see strong liquidity, which they probably don't give, as this is a, a very specialized area. So the last area I wanted to touch on is green bonds. Now, bonds as a whole very established, of course it is. Um, and green bonds is really becoming an incredible feature at the moment of the market. Um, uh, just today in the FT, I saw that uh, they were talking about how the green bond market has grown, where we've now got um, over a billion, uh, euro, a billion dollars worth of green bonds, which have been issued cumulatively over the last 10 years. And bearing in mind, 10 years ago, it was unheard of. So now we've got over a billion. And by the end of 2023, their prediction is that there's going to be over three trillion US dollars worth of green bonds. So this is no longer a niche area. It's now an area where there is going to be considerable investment and considerable focus. With this focus, it also uh, brings with it some, you could say negative, but certainly more questioning um, direction. Um, and the topic which comes up is greenwashing. Are people really providing green credentials? Um, are the assets really going to be used? And I'm going to come on to this on the next slide to talk about this in more detail. Uh, one example, though, is the state of Queensland in Australia, where she's trying to issue a green bond at the moment. Its uh, stated intent is to use the funding to uh, support the refurbishment and, and protection of the Great Barrier Reef. No doubt at all, that's a fantastic green cause. However, the state of Queensland is also a very significant coal mining company uh, area. Uh, it supports and promotes coal-fired power plants. And so this is attracting a lot of negative uh, criticism from um, campaigning groups who are saying, well, actually, they shouldn't be allowed to be call these green bonds because their overall focus is not to be a, a green organization. Anyway, on this point, uh, uh, I'll just pause, um, pass you back to Alan for our third and last poll, and then uh, we'll have just a last quick focus on green bonds in particular before we can open up to a wider, um, a wider Q and A session. So, Helen, back over to thank, you. Thank you, Mark. Right, we're going to um, do our, our third poll. What tenor do you or would you prefer for an infrastructure investment? 
five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, or other. 10 years is um, by far the majority, 65%, followed by 15 years, 24%, 20 years, and other tie at 6%. And interestingly, nobody has um, voted for five years. Thank you, Helen. Um, well, I'm delighted to see no one for, for uh, five years. Um, there was another which may have been shorter, but uh, hopefully not, because these are long-term assets and investments. We can move on to the next screen now, and just dive quickly into green bonds. Actually, I, I should say also, when I looked at poll one, very good to see that uh, there was also a zero uptake of the invest less in infrastructure at the moment. So uh, hopefully this is supporting my comments about building back better and investing uh, more. So uh, let me just see if we can get this page. I don't know why my page is sticking today, but there they are. Um, so um, to dive slightly into, into the green bonds, what are they and how they can they be used? Um, normally, and this is of course speaking generalization, I'm sure everyone will be able to find, find a, a, a variant to this if they look hard enough. But generally speaking, the green bonds I'm talking about here are bonds which are issued or should be issued to finance specific accredited green projects. Um, come on to the accreditation in a second. And in order to also provide protection and dedication of, of the, the funding, so there's a clear tie between the use of funds and the purpose of them, then they should be issued by special purpose, uh, single purpose, uh, special project vehicles, um, which are ring fenced and therefore insolvency remote. So the actual asset is what is being financed here. And if you're providing that dedicated finance to the asset or the project in this case, this means that the cash flows need to be transparent and they should be because there's a very clear cash in project does what it's meant to be doing, hopefully. And then as the cash cash is generated, priority is given to the share, bond shareholders as the senior secured creditors to that project company. Now I mentioned accreditation and to be certified as green, bonds need to fit you in within various uh, recognized international um, certifiers. There's a whole lot of variants at the moment. It's still one of the areas of uh, discussion and people say, well, which framework should we use? And we're starting, I think, to settle on a few key ones, the ICMA green bond principles. For many years, there's been a climate bonds initiative. Um, and also still a lot of talk about, well, the taxonomy is being moved around and the who verifies and under what particular scheme. As one uh, asset manager said, you should know if a project is doing the right thing or not. I mean, you can talk about, yes, how we're verifying this or verifying that, but if it's a very clear um, renewable energy project, you, you don't really need to justify it too much. Um, ideally, but not necessarily, these projects will work with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that we set up by the UN. And in fact, most of the projects uh, do that. Uh, we are flagging in, in case of uh, uh, the, the green bonds that we're working on, just some of the uh, accreditations here, affordable clean energy, industry innovation, infrastructure, helping communities and, and so on. And finally, um, this should be an ongoing process uh, and the assets need to be monitored and reported on and very clear annual reports should be given to, to the investment group. I want to finally illustrate this with a real example. Uh, Gridserve are developing a, a green bond issuance program, uh, pipeline if you like. Uh, as Toddington said, uh, we are a vertically integrated renewable energy asset. So in the same way that the oil companies talked about well to wheel, we can call it sun to wheel as we generate our electricity from our sun here on the uh, uh, one side of the screen and ship the electricity either into the grid and or into our electric forecourts. And there's the, uh, the Braintree electric forecourt as well. And in fact, to, to prove this, um, we are uh, issuing the first bond uh, in the coming months, which will be 
a refinancing of these two projects and operating solar and battery storage project together with the Braintree Electric forecourt. And both these assets will be wrapped together, which we assume will provide lower risk as their existing operating projects. But you can see the clear vertical integration. And of course, solar is a, a very established asset class now. And these upstream downstream synergies should also provide a lot of price protection and margin protection as well. Um, <clears throat> what are the revenue streams? Well, now is not the time to really go into this in detail. Uh, interestingly, the uh, consulting firm Roland Berger has written uh, an article on EV charging infrastructure. And they said, EV charging revenue is the tip of an iceberg. And the profit pool is much beneath the surface. And blowing down, we absolutely agree with these guys. Um, here's, uh, we've actually got over a dozen different revenue streams uh, coming from our electric vehicle charging stations. And importantly, this diversification of revenues not only lowers risks overall, but it also allows us to, to head off that essential question of how quickly will electric vehicles grow? Now, we believe, particularly with the ban on combustion engine cars and um, hybrid cars uh, at, in 2030, that builders may come and will be an understatement that there is going to be a great rush. But the important thing is that these revenues for bondholders are very strong indeed and provide very robust long-term cash yielding assets. So in conclusion, um, our aim today was to, to provide you with an understanding of investment opportunities in the net, net zero carbon transport infrastructure world. Uh, we hope we've done that, we've gone very fast, but turning to now and uh, able to provide uh, time for some questions and answers, either here and now, um, or if you want to uh, follow up with some questions and to visit our Braintree Electric Forecourt site, our contact details are below. I'll pass you back to Helen, uh, who can take us through the, uh, the Q&A session. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thanks everyone for your, your questions. Um, if we um, start with an, an anonymous attendee, um, a question to Toddington. How do we compare with Norway, where around one third of new cars are already electric? Do they have more or most public or destination or home? Yeah, it's a really good question. So Norway is, um, is just a little bit ahead of the UK in the context of the policy that we've put in place to, um, to really incentivize the move to electric vehicles. Um, and actually now, I think the figures have gone that over 60% of new vehicles in Norway are now electric. Um, and as a whole, there's a considerable number of electric vehicles actually within the within the fleet in Norway. Um, the uh, it, you know the, the answer to the question is 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 it it does form into all three areas, both home charging, destination charging, and public. But the thing that we find really interesting, and the feedback that we've had consistently, and we're in contact with a number of people in Norway as well, is that there are there are very large queues already forming outside public infrastructure in Norway. Um, and so that's kind of where we're coming from, which is that, you know, we're, we're putting, as we've talked about, 30 charges into Braintree, six of them Tesla, uh, 24 of them ours. Uh, and we, we really think it's that sort of quantum that's needed, um, depending on various locations, uh, to, uh, to serve you know, an equivalent amount of throughput that you would get from a petrol station. Uh, and, and ultimately, if a vehicle is going to be there for you know, 20 to 30 minutes, uh, a lot quicker in the future, um, then you really do need a number of charges. So in summary, um, the public charging infrastructure is already very overcrowded in Norway. Uh, that's leading to something called charge anxiety. They don't really have range anxiety anymore because people are sure that they're not going to run out of energy. And they might, they'll get to their destination. There's enough charges. It's just people aren't sure how long they're going to be waiting for those charges for. But yeah, public charging overloaded uh, and the other options are, are still prevalent as well. And that's happened very, very quickly. You know, from, from a few years to, to being you know, not an issue at all to now being one of the main issues. Thank you. And we have um, another question from Kevin Crabtree. Um, 
He's also got an EB. He's had one for seven years. He read into the future possible infrastructure for charging. Is high power induction charging a real possibility in the future? This will affect the investment value of plug-in investments. Yeah, so induction is a, um, if I'll just jump in this one as well, it's something that we like in principle. Um, not using wires is great. Um, you know, wires can wear out and the plugs can be an issue and so on. Um, but it's just very complex. The main issue with induction charging is then you need um, then you need to have uh, kind of uniformity, standardization, uh, and you need to have vehicles putting the induction chargers and the pads that can make induction chargers work uh, universal format and standard across all of the vehicles. We just don't see that happening. So we, we have seen certain niche applications for, for certain taxis, for example, there's a project uh, also in Norway that's happening in that regard, also with Jaguar Land Rover. Um, we as a company are, are future proofing so that if you know at some point in the future we think it's probably going to be quite far in the future that induction charging does happen at scale and people have solved the standardization and so on we would want to be able to retrofit so that someone could turn up and they could charge with a cable or, or if the, or if there's an induction pad they wouldn't have to plug in so we're, we're thinking through that now but we, we do think that there's an awful lot of complexity um, we're, you know, we're way, be, way behind Betamax versus VHS, a lot more to it than that. And there's also you know, many, many different manufacturers to consider. You know, the, the area that we're focusing on at the moment that, that is the real challenge is which cable to use, let alone which option to use if you don't have a cable. So it's a really good question. Um, we're in the detail and we're, we're preparing for it, but we just don't see it as a, uh, a realistic near-term option for the market. <laughs> Anecdotally, one, one small problem they've had in some of the early testing of, of the pads is that they become very warm. And so it's a great place for cats to go and lie, um, which may sound quite trite, but the problem is you don't want to have too many cats being run over by this before uh, people coming out with the pitch, pitchforks and uh, uh, torches. There's quite a lot of issues. You also need to be directly on the pads so uh, to get the best contacts. And, and that really plays back into autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles are clearly coming as well. And when you have got autonomous vehicles and you have got standardization, then you know, inductive charging is really helpful because you, know, you don't have to physically pick up a cable and put it in. Um, so, and also it means that if it's autonomous, you can very precisely get over that pad. Uh, for a computer to work that out with a human in many cases. So in summary, we support it. Um, we support really all of the options and we're, but it's, um, there are, as Mark said, some significant additional complexities that are being worked through uh, in addition to just the te technological ones. Thank you. Um, just question, um, time for one more question. Um, London currently has more than 200 electric buses, making it Europe's largest electric bus fleet. How do we build on the combination of public transport using e-buses and a transition of private cars from petrol, diesel to electric? It's a big question and we've literally got a, a minute. So um, if Toddington or Mark, if you'd like to answer that. Yeah, okay, I'll just jump on and give the first answer. So it, it is a, um, it's a big thing in electric buses, but it's, uh, it's, it's not a big thing worldwide. In China, there are hundreds of thousands of electric buses already today. Um, and, and, and that is a big thing. Uh, and, uh, and, and there will be at some point in London all of the buses which will be electric, which will be a huge number. London's particularly complex because there are, in terms of the ratio of, you know, of going from, you know, actually public infrastructure is probably quite straightforward to, to, to solve because there's a small number of depots. When you're resolving um, charging for individuals, domestic and commercial, that's more tricky because there's much less than 40% of London has access to off-street parking. So a combination of solutions is required. Um, You'll need much more higher power charging uh, in, in many more locations in London to serve the people who have no ability to otherwise charge from home. Uh, in addition to some on-street on, on options, um, but it, it's very important in places like London that you just don't cover streets with, with wires and cables uh, mm. as well. Many additional challenges. So, you know, it's a combination of solutions, um, repetitive theme that's required, and it's particularly complex in areas like London us and a num number of organizations are certainly working on, on solving that and we will. Thank you, thank you Toddington.
I'll just close now by saying many thanks again to Toddington and Mark for joining us today. And a big thank you to all of you for watching. We really hope you've enjoyed it. Have a good rest of the day and goodbye from us. Thank you. Goodbye.